Welcome to SOGCAST number 13. Today, we are bringing this latest update from Mac V. SOG stories, courtesy of Jocko Willing Productions, and of course, his right-hand man, Echo Charles. And today, we have a special technician, Carrie Hilton, with us. We thank you, and without that uh, support, these stories would not be come to you. And today, we are having another Green Beret medic who served in Mac V. SOG and one tour of duty, but it was a tour of duty that has led to two very interesting books, and well, actually one book with an expanded edition, and then uh, we have a third book in the work. And uh, today I want to welcome to the show Joe Parner. Joe, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tote. It's a pleasure to have you here, and uh, you, know, you and I met many years ago at the reunion, and uh, during that time, We've come to find out more about your story, which brings you here today as a Green Beret medic flying first with Chase, and then eventually you wound up running some missions across the fence. <laughs> so um, talk, start out with uh, how did all this begin for you as getting into the Army, and then you, where you went through your basic training, and then um, ultimately becoming a Green Beret medic, which still to this day are the best medics in the world? Well. I started off as a student at the University of Massachusetts. I was a junior, and unlike of many of the students, I was a war supporter. And when we'd go out to the watering <laughs> holes and argue about the war, I was always pro-U.S. because I was a John Kennedy fan, and to me, you know, the expressions like, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Indeed really meant something to me. Also, we will defend every any friend, oppose any foe to preserve liberty. Those things were things that I believed in. They counted. Yeah, and I got my bluff called one night when we were out. Somebody says, ah, you're no different than the rest of us. You're hiding from the draft here, right? And I says, no, I'm not. He says, well, if you feel that way, why don't you quit school and join the Army? And I says, that's what I'm gonna do. And I had all my friends there. And I didn't want to look <laughs> like a fool and have them say, this guy just is a BSer. Yeah. So I quit school and went to see the uh, recruiter and uh, took tests and got into the Army. And uh, when I dropped out of school, it was the end of April of 66. And uh, lo and behold, I got called up for a draft phys you know a draft exam because i was no longer a student and wasn't protected with student status right and uh, i had arranged with the recruiter hey i'll go in around the end of summer i can have my last hurrah right. you know i was gonna do that i got called up for that physical and a month later about two weeks later i got a notice medically disqualified retest in one month and the only thing i had to do on the retest was have my chest x-ray taken again so anyway, I went for that, and I, it was we were getting close to August when I was going in, yeah. and I never got the results for that until I was in basic training. <laughs> and when I was in basic, my mother forwarded the letter on from the local draft board, and it still read, medically disqualified, retest in one month. <laughs> <laughs> and I was afraid that they'd kick me out of the army. Yeah when I was in basic, so what I did is I ripped that letter up into little pieces because, you know, they'd do shakedown inspections. Oh, and yeah, everything. of course. And I flushed it down the toilet in the barracks. <laughs> <laughs> get rid of the evidence. Yeah, get rid of the evidence. So uh, <laughs> uh, for some reason, I had flunked two draft physicals and never really found out why. No kidding. Yeah, but uh, anyway, I went through basic at Fort yeah. Dix in New Jersey, completed that eight weeks, and then from there, we went directly to Fort Gordon, Georgia for advanced, or for Airborne Infantry AIT. Right, AIT, yeah. Yeah. And by the way, the, way I, the reason I went Airborne was uh, a person I worked summers, I'd worked during the summer back home, and he said to me, go Airborne, those guys are tough. <laughs> so that's why I enlisted for Airborne Infantry. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, Fort Gordon was, uh, we got tested at Fort Gordon for Special Forces. And one of the requirements, requirements at that time was you had to be 20 years old. And uh, I was like 23, so 
<laughs> I didn't have any problem with that, but I remember I maxed their math exam. It was 25 word problems. I got 100% and, <laughs> and when, when we went to brag, they gave us the exact same <laughs> test and I got one wrong. I guess <laughs> I had guessed right the first time. <laughs> but anyway, uh, 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 then I uh, got held, all of us going uh, to uh, special forces got held over for a couple days at Fort Benning after uh, jump school. And then they bust us to uh, Fort Bragg. Sure. And uh, there I, I wanted to be an engineer and blow stuff up. More fun. Yes, it, <laughs> it was. <laughs> and the only problem with uh, that was I hated KP when I had it a few times in basic and in, in, oh, yeah. in AIT, and I hated that. And uh, the sergeant said to me, "Gee, well, you know, you've got uh, physiology, anatomy from uh, uh, college because I was a physical education major." He right. says, "You'd be a perfect fit to be a medic." You know, I says. And that was I knew it was thirty seven weeks of training, right? Oh yeah. Engineers was like twelve weeks or something, or fourteen. <laughs> so I said, No, I want to be an engineer, right? So he says, Well, he says, uh, the next engineering class isn't gonna start for about, I don't know, twelve weeks or something. You'll have KP every other day. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and then he says to me, We got a medics class that's starting Monday. You wouldn't even have to pull KP. <laughs> so I went medics. <laughs> uh, and medics is the one MOS I knew that I couldn't do. So here you are. You're signed up for it and ready to roll. Well, uh, things went pretty good uh, in the medics. Uh, uh, I learned a lot uh, going through the training. It, it was tough training. Oh, but yeah. we'd, we'd have information fed to us during the week. And every Friday we'd have an exam on that week's. Uh, work and then of course when you get to the end of training after dog lab and all that uh, you end up uh, having to go before a board of five officers that are doctors and one sergeant major oh is that right yeah i forgot about the board yeah and then they they'd quiz you on anything you had all year long you know so and uh, during some of your early phases you also got quizzes like daily right you came in you'd be have a coursework and then you're tested the next day yeah usually it was the weekly test okay uh, we didn't yeah. really have uh, spot uh, pop quizzes or anything like that but you really had to do your homework though yeah, you, you had to do some, but I was always a slacker at homework and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I never wanted to be the honor graduate or anything like that. Just get through. Right, <laughs> uh, I'm with you. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so that kind of uh, filled out my training. It was funny, when we finished and graduated, it was in December of 67 that we yeah. finished uh, what was called phase four then which was you go out and play soldier. The FTX. Yeah, and then you have to do a 30-mile hike in 24 hours, and uh, after that, you can graduate. And that, and that graduate. FTX, yeah. is that the one where it snowed? Uh, no, but we did have uh, water ice on the swamp uh, that was right near where our campsite was. <laughs> yeah, because our FTX was the same time. Okay. It was December of 67, and we had we got snow up there. We were up in the Uari Forest. Oh, okay. They they did us out at Camp McCall. Good training for Vietnam. Yeah, they yeah, did. Yeah, having some snow. <laughs> yeah, they did it with us in Camp McCall. And uh, uh, I remember after we had graduated, they said, uh, here, list the three places you'd like to be assigned, you know. Oh, yeah, of course. And, of course, everybody, all 43 medics that graduated with me Vietnam, Vietnam, Vietnam. Oh, is that right? I core, two core, three core, or three core, two core. You had a choice four. of cores. Well, <laughs> that was our wish list. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Nobody got assigned to Vietnam out of the forty-three medics. Some no, of us. No, is that right? I got assigned to the seventh. A lot of us to the seventh, to the third, to the sixth. Some people went to Panama. We had a couple guys go to language school at Presidio. Yeah, yeah, and. We had a couple, I think, that ended up going to Germany with the 10th, but nobody got there. And, you know, I, at that point, I had been in the Army about a year and a half. And I figured, hey, if I'm going to be with the 7th for a year, I'm not going to. I joined the, uh, the Army to go to Vietnam. Yeah. And I figured 
I'm not going to get there. <laughs> but we had heard of this angel in the Pentagon named Mrs. Billy Alexander, who they said could get you on the manifests to go to Vietnam. Uh, when we graduated, we were going home for a Christmas leave. They were that was right of sure around Christmas time, and I wrote I, a friend of mine, uh, Chuck Willoughby. He was the uh, nephew of Congressman Alfonso Bell from California, right? And he had visited his, his uncle the week before, and he had his car with congressional plates on it. <laughs> so Chuck said to me, hey, you're going to Massachusetts? Ride up to D.C. with me, and you can fly from there, you know? Yeah, and yeah. So we're riding up 95, I think it was, going 95 miles an hour. I guess Chuck figured that that's how fast you had to go because that was the route number. <laughs> <And> the, <laughs> it makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah. and uh, we... Uh, I remember at one point we had a highway patrol car pull up about eight feet behind our bumper. And when he saw the congressional place, he, he just faded back into, never oh, even man. stopped us. <laughs> so we, on the way, I said to Chuck, hey, drop me off at the Pentagon. I'm going to find Mrs. Alexander and get on the manifest for Vietnam. We got into D.C. It was about maybe nine, ten, nine or ten in the morning. Yeah. So he drops me off at the Pentagon. He hands me one of his uncle's business cards and says, if you get anywhere in there, call me at the number on this card, you know? So I walked up this, there was no signs like main entrance, right. receptionists or anything. So I'm walking up a, a, a looked like a driveway to a loading dock. <laughs> and there was, there was an, a uniform guard on the loading dock. And I got up there and I was in uniform at the time, spec four, you know? Indeed. He said to me, uh, can I help you, specialist? And I says, yes, sir, I'm looking for Mrs. Alexander. <laughs> I didn't realize it at the time, but the Pentagon employed about 15,000 people at that time. Yeah, right. You know what he said to me? She's on the sixth corridor, C ring. No. If you go through this door, he says, it's gonna put you on the E ring. He says, go down till you get to the sixth corridor, <laughs> go in two more rings and ask somebody. She works in that area. The puzzle palace. Yeah. yeah. So there I am at the junction of the sixth corridor and the C ring, and this is there's no receptionist again. You know, I'm yeah looking lost, and an army major stopped and said, "Can I help you, specialist?" And I said, <laughs> "Yes, sir. I'm looking for Mrs. Alexander." And he pointed to a little hallway off the sixth corridor and says go down that hallway she works somewhere in that area so i walked in it opened into a huge room with about a hundred desks with people working at them yeah and once again i'm looking lost and an army whack major came up and said can i help you specialist <laughs> i says yes ma'am i'm looking for mrs alexander she said see the blonde three rows in and two desks over I says, yes, ma'am. She's that's her. I says, do I need an appointment to see her? She says, no, you can go right over. Isn't that something? So I zigzagged between <laughs> the desks and introduced myself. And she took my name, rank, serial number, and said, see that room that says E7 and above? She says, go in there and wait. I'll have somebody pull your records. So I went in there, and guess what? There's a sergeant major sitting in that E7 and above room. <laughs> and up to that point, I, I had no exposure to sergeant majors and figured right. they ate spec fours and PFCs yeah. for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, I grabbed Time Magazine, present, pretended to be reading it, and uh, he piped up. <clears throat> Specialist, I think the enlisted men's waiting room is the next one down. I said to him, Mrs. Alexander told me to come in here and wait, sergeant major. He said, oh, my moment of glory was about to arrive in the Army. <laughs> a whack private came in about five minutes later and said, Specialist Parner, Mrs. Alexander will see you now. Really? <laughs> yes. That quick? <laughs> yep. And I, he was waiting to see her, too, because I later found out she was in charge of E7 and above replacements. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, yeah. Uh, when I got out uh, to sit with her, uh, she, I, I 
told her I wanted to get on the manifest, and she's well, they're not turning over with the fifth group until, I, uh, I mean, April of 68. Right. And I said, uh, well, what, what about the 46th company in Thailand, which I didn't know what they did, but I knew they had something to do with the war. <laughs> she thought, they're not turning over until August. Oh, wow. Is that so right? I, says, I yeah. said, well, ma'am, could you please put me on manifest for April? And she says, well, we have openings in April for SOG. Do you know about SOG? I said, oh, yes. <laughs> That's about all I knew about it. <laughs> <laughs> so she put me on the manifest for SOG. The only thing I had heard of SOG was everybody that gets killed or wounded. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. You heard that when you were going through training groups yeah. then? Yeah, and you know, we knew that the rumor scuttlebutt was one of the instructors had been with SOG, and when we got towards the, near the phase four end of the training, there were some classified classes, and so we'd kind of ask, is this what SOG does over there? No, I don't know, know anything about them. This is the way it always was, yeah, real yeah. hush-hush and stuff. So anyway, I walked out of the Pentagon, I was a little shaky, what the heck did I just volunteer for, right? <laughs> <laughs> I got to a phone booth near where Chuck Willoughby had left me off and dialed the number on his card. He answered the phone, I says, I'm on the manifest for SOG in April. Where are you, he said. I said, the phone booth right down a little short distance from where you left me off. Wait right there, I'll be there, right? So I sat in his, uncle's car there with the congressional plates on it well he went back in and came back in about 30 minutes and he was on the manifest facade too no kidding yeah he served up at ccn by the way uh well chuck was at fub1 okay all right he's up there with george bagan yeah and yep. john wong yeah that's we all we all gathered there and chuck had the uh, best looking mustache in camp Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was always admiring his mustache. <laughs> he had really good mustache wax. Tell him where he yeah. got it from. <laughs> yeah, so uh, anyway, that got me on the way to Vietnam. Of course, uh, I had to go to the 7th until April. Uh, well, uh, my orders came down in March, and uh, they let me go home for 30 days, and then beginning of April is when I went over to Vietnam. And... Uh, I remember I got hell in at in the seventh. I started going like in February or the end of February to find out if I uh, uh, my orders were in yet. Right. And after about a week, the, I don't know, Sergeant E seven or E eight or, or something says, to me, "What makes you think you're getting uh, orders for Vietnam?" I said, "Well, I saw Mrs. Alexander in December, and I'm supposed to." You're not supposed to see Mrs. Alexander. You're supposed to put in the proper paperwork, blah, blah, uh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> they came down anyway. And <laughs> so, so when did you, so you landed in Vietnam in early April? Uh, of 68. Yeah, er, early April of 68. And like I had mentioned to you before, I had that case of eczema that flared up on me. Yeah. And I looked like a mess. I looked like my khaki pants had been had somebody blow their nose all over oh. them. It was, they were all, you could see discolorations from where the yeah. body fluids weeped out and uh, oh my God. would stick to the pants. And oh, it gets better, Tilt, because uh, <laughs> uh, I, when I got, along the way, uh, I didn't, something happened to my security clearance that they fingerprinted us right. for in training group. Yeah. So when I was, finishing going to the seventh they had to redo it so i could get my in the meantime when i was with the seventh i had to wear the little can the little stripe on the hat not the full flash because i really you got to have the security clearance to wear the full flash no kidding yeah so anyway uh um to, when you go to Vietnam, the fifth group would make you wear the full flash, though, and have sure. it put on when you were going to Vietnam. So uh, that didn't become an issue. But anyway, I got to Nha Trang, and it became, uh, got to hang here for your, wait here for your security clearance to catch up. The, it was a, a, a security clearance for secret. Right. To get the top secret, you had to have a, a full uh, secret and then they could put you in for an interim top secret. Right, we had a lot of guys with that yeah. when we went over. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so that's the situation I was in. So they put me 
24 hours on, 24 hours off, working in the transit barracks at Natrang. And one of my 24 hours off, I figured, gee, maybe this eczema stuff will go away if I get some sun on it, you know? I went to the beach and conked out for a couple hours, and I got really sunburned bad. <laughs> I looked like a Roman gladiator with a breastplate, <laughs> but it was a big scab. My whole chest ended up being like a scab, oh, no. right? Yeah, yeah. And it cracked <clears throat> and was oozing and stuff. And so I went to the dispensary there, and uh, they said, well, they put me on a helicopter, send me back to Cameron Bay to the dermatology clinic. Really, and, this, is all, this is all welcome to Vietnam. You yeah. got skin issues. Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> and when I got there, they said, oh, we'll keep you here through the weekend. If it's not better, we'll ship you back to the States. Man, that panicked me. I went through a lot of crap to get there, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. And here they're going to send me home. So I said to him, I'm a medic. I says it was Burroughs Solution Soaks I would have had to put yeah. on it. And he says... Uh, I says, give me the medication. I says, I've got to work. I, ca I can't not go back to, to Natrang, you know? Yeah. Uh, so give me the soaks, I'm a medic. If it's not better, I'll come back. It never it didn't get better right away, but I didn't go back there ever. <laughs> <laughs> I learned my lesson from that, <laughs> whining about it. But uh, it was in the beginning of May when uh, I uh, got... Uh, you got the clearance? Got and then, the clearance. And then you began the three-week country chain. And then they sent me up to Da Nang, where we stayed in House 22, and... Uh, you didn't get any in-country training first? No. No kidding. Well, maybe the normal people would, but see, I was... <laughs> uh, I, We're not gonna call you I normal. was in reform school at, <laughs> at Nha Trang. <Indeed>. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I... Uh, so you go to Da Nang, you see you get your top secret briefing. Yeah, yeah, and you know what was really funny, because. <laughs> I had learned enough about getting in trouble in the Army, and we had a major come up and brief us, and he says, these missions are classified top secret, never to be declassified. Oh, I'm, wait a minute, I think it was top secret, no foreign, never to be declassified and never downgraded. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. So, you know, hey, this is tough yeah. stuff. Then the next guy comes in as a full bird colonel. I don't know which one it was. Could have been Jack Warren, little guy, dark it, it hair. Could have been. He comes yeah. in and tells us, "You men are going to be some, running some of the best missions in Vietnam. Someday they're going to write books about these missions." And I had the real strong urge to raise my hand and say, uh, "Sir, but what about what the previous major said? How are they going <laughs> to write books if they'll never be declassified?" But I knew enough. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that you get KP from that kind of stuff in the army. <laughs> so anyway, then we all got. To, I I was assigned to FOB two uh, in Contum. So right. uh, after a day or two of relaxing at House Twenty Two, they shipped us down to uh, Contum. And uh, once again, when we got there. Uh, I think I got there with Bobby Garcia the same day. Bobby Garcia, I think you know Bobby. Yeah, we you? went through training group together. Yeah, and we oh. went to Vietnam together. Okay. Yeah. All right. Absolutely. But, uh, we both arrived the same day, and he, he wanted to go recon. I wanted to be on recon, right? Yeah. I got assigned to the dispensary. Medics. Yeah, and Bobby got assigned to the commo shack to go and monitor the radios. That's you right. Know, yeah. A lot and stuff and. We, uh, we eventually formed, uh, he and a bunch of other Como guys, a, a support group where we'd go to the club and cry in our beer and whine about the fact that they wouldn't let uh, us on recon. Like David Fritz, <laughs> was he there too? Uh, uh, Ken Worthley was one of the people. Sure. And Kenny ended up dying over right. there on his extension. And Ron Bozikas. He ended up dying over there too. In fact, the only combo guy that didn't get killed, but we had a guy named Simmons that was in our whining group. Right. And uh, everybody got, all of those combo guys got a shot at recon. And Bobby Garcia is the only one that didn't get killed. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Good man. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Bobby was an excellent person. Uh, so. Uh, so you get down to the dispensary, and then at some point, when do you start riding Chase? Well, the first thing uh, when I got to the dispensary was the head medic. Hey, 
can you get me on a recon team? No, we need you here, he said, right? <laughs> but he says, I'll tell you. He says, you'll have an opportunity to fly Chase Medic, which uh, I'll explain what that is in yeah, a second. And, uh, or you can go out with some of the hatchet force operations and stuff like that. Because they needed a medic to go along with them. But yeah. the recon teams was not guaranteed to have a medic. Correct. Deep. And uh, the re our, I don't know how it was up at uh, uh, FOB1. FOB1, yeah. But our hatchet forces did not have American medics assigned to them. They came out of the dispensary as the missions came up. They'd assign a medic or two. Okay, go along with this. Right, so, right. Uh, so uh, anyway, I, I kind of consoled myself. I guess I'm going to be a medic and stuff but uh, what chase medic entailed was uh, we launched out of fob2 for the 90 percent of our missions were run by huey slicks we had uh oh, i think four or five helicopter companies that were supporting us the 57th uh the 119th the uh 170th the 189th and then the 20th special operations Squadron. Yeah, the Air Force. That was an the Air Green Force. Green Hornets. Yeah. Right. That was uh, the Green Hornets of the Air Force. And uh, usually our missions were the helicopter support was four Huey Slicks and four gunships. Four, huh? Yep. When oh, I, wow. When I first started, they were all Charlie model gunships. They could barely get off the ground. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and then towards the end of the, I went on recon after that a little while. I'll explain that in a little bit. But uh, we didn't get Cobras until August. Uh, the 361st uh, Aerial Weapons Company or sure. something. You got Cobras before we did. Oh, did really? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. But uh, anyway, uh, so I... For about a month and a half, I uh, uh, was flying chase. You know, not every day it was. Yeah, like, because we, just for our listening audience, you have for insertions there would be two helicopters with the recon team, and there'd be one helicopter with the with the team leader, a couple men, a second helicopter, right. and then there'd be a third helicopter with a chase medic. So if anything that, got shot down that's or correct. everybody's wounded, the medic is there to take care of them to get them back to base, keep right. them alive. Right. For the most part, we didn't go down and pick up teams unless somebody was wounded. Right. There were exceptions, though. There were times when we'd go down and pick up the team, you know, part of a team or this. Uh, but it depended also. A lot of times, if it was a real light team, six men, two Americans, and four in Dig, uh, it might you might be able to do it with just one helicopter. Sure, it just depends on the uh, elevation. Exactly. How hot it was, what time yeah, of year. But a 10 or 12 man team was a two ship insertion. And uh, Did you have many king bees down there? We did have king bees, but really the only use that I recall was when we were inserting like a platoon or a company, mm -hmm. uh, that we'd have right. king bee support for those. You had a lot of other units attached. Yeah. Sure. So, but, so at some point you go from riding chase. Well, of course, riding chase there were some hairy incidents because if somebody's wounded on the ground, the chase has to go in. You're the chase medic. You jump off to help get somebody oh, in yeah. the helicopter. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about that side because at first glance, you think, oh, you're just going along. If something goes wrong, go go down and help. But that's yeah. Hairy, sometimes that turns into a very hairy mission. It can be so, potentially sometimes dangerous. Sometimes you have to uh, get off the helicopter and you sure. know, go and help carry the person or uh, that's wounded. In one instance, uh, oh, and this was quite a bit later, uh, I had to rappel into a crashed helicopter. Uh, really? But it was it was only about four clicks from Ben Hat. We were coming out of Cambodia, right? Uh, with a six man recon team. In fact. They were in, that mission was in a way connected with uh, Bob Howard's Medal of Honor, uh, really uh, award. Yeah, uh, that whole mission started off on the 29th of uh, December when we lost the recon man named Sheridan, Robert Sheridan. Right, and uh, he was in there. His uh, one zero was Gerald Apperson, and uh, the next day they put in. Uh, uh, Gerson, Howard, 
Robert Gron and Jerome Griffin and a bunch of mountain yards to go and try to get Sheridan's body out because they couldn't so get So it's like his, a heavy recon team. Yep. Yeah, so they put them in and they got all shot to hell. And in fact, they got extracted at night. They had to drop flares to light the LZ for the helicopters to get in and pull them out. Wow. And it's funny because Gerson was killed. He brought a body bag to bring Sheridan's body out in and he came out in it. Whoa. <laughs> and uh, so then on January 4th, Gerald Apperson led, he picked up another American, a young guy named Bill Williams, and they went back in to find Sheridan because they were with him, so they would be the, you know. Sure. Be able to locate and the. And they're familiar with the, with the, the target. Terrain, yeah. yeah. And uh, we went and picked, we were pulling them out. They didn't find his body, but on the 4th, on the 8th of uh January. January, we were uh, we extracted them. The first uh, Huey Slick from the one seventieth uh, damaged its tail rotor trying to squeeze down through the opening in the jungle, and the it started the ship sh started to sh uh, shake violently. So they flew back to Dark Toe where we launched out of, and the second ship in did get down on the ground and picked up the six man recon team. Sheridan, uh, Williams, and uh, the Indige. And they reported when they were coming out that they had taken hits and their transmission warning light was on. And they, some of the other pilots had uh, tried to convince the aircraft commander to set it down and we'll, you know, pick right. you up with one of the other ships. He said, no, I'll try to make it to Ben Het. He came up four clicks short, short in the uh, oh. helicopter. The rotor froze up and it went in upside down and crashed. And the chase ship I was flying on uh, uh, landed on, there was a road that went past Ben Hat, out past the old French fort to the tri-border junction right. in that area. Mm -hmm. And uh, he landed on the road and jumped out of the, his you know, left seat out of the helicopter. And I figured maybe there's something wrong with our helicopter, you know? <laughs> and he runs off in the jungle and I turned around to ask somebody, am I supposed to go with him? And the co-pilot took the, the ship off. So we started flying, you know, hovering or, or low leveling around the yeah, area yeah. of the crash. And the door gunner said to me, do you know how to repel? So I, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I had rappelled three times on the practice tower at the FOB, but but not from a helicopter. That's really different. No, yeah, I rigged up a Swiss seat and I rappelled out. The only thing was, the door gunner threw out 150 feet or 120 feet of rope, whatever the length of those yeah. were, and we were only about 60 feet off the ground, and it was bamboo under us. In the rotor wash, bent all the bamboo over, so it was like I could walk on it. It was like a mat to walk on. No kidding. And the rope was all spaghettied all over that, you know. Yeah, yeah. So when I got to it, I had to kick my way and fight my way to get through the bamboo and get to the ground. <laughs> and it was funny because when I got down through the bamboo, the lower part of the rope was now above me, and I had to pull sections of it down so it would allow me to inch down towards the ground. Right. And uh, I finally got on the ground and I, I had enough sense to tell the door gunner, lower the radio to me, my PRC 25 radio to me. I knew being on the ground with no comma wasn't a good situation, <laughs> right? So right. he lowered that down and I had the same problem with that. It got hung up in the bamboo and I look, oh, that's the branch that's holding it up. I go there shaking the bamboo. I think, no. Man, the enemy's going to think I'm a nut here. I'm running around shaking the bamboo trees. And finally, I got the radio and I waved for the, I could see the door gunner above me and I waved, you know, get out of here now. And so now I'm on the ground. I take my radio. I'm going to call Covey. No answer. I says, you know, what am I supposed to do now that I'm on the ground? So I, I went to where the ship was on fire, burning and ex exploding ammunition and stuff like oh, that, yeah. and grenades and stuff were going off. So I got as close as I could, and when I started getting fairly close to it, I could hear the 
fragments in the bullets, uh, shredding the leaves above me and stuff above my head. So I hunkered down behind like a log, uh, yeah. a fallen obstruction. And uh, I figured I'll try to call Covey again, right? So I got the radio and I got tapped on the left shoulder by someone. I snapped my head around figuring I'm gonna see a flash. A muzzle flash, yeah, right. you know. It was an American I had never seen before. From where? He was on a patrol, a platoon-sized sweep. They were doing a sweep of that area, and when the ship went down, they moved over to, to the crash site to secure it. And he says to me, don't go over that way. We're, we're taking enemy fire from over there, right? Yeah, yeah. So he says, follow me. So I followed him, and when we got back with his in Dig, there was one other American, I think a guy named Greer was his name, and that pilot who ran off and abandoned his ship was there too, right? Really? Yep, and so, you know, there was really a lot of explosions and secondaries going off from where the ship crashed. Sure. So after about 15 minutes, 20 minutes, uh, it slowed down a little bit, and the guy introduced himself. He says, his name was Bobby Dunham, and he was on a patrol out of Ben Hatt. And he says that they moved over into that area. And after about 20 minutes, we decided we'll go and see if there's anybody alive, you know? Sure. Because they were only up about 1,000 feet probably when that thing went down. But I figured, hey, after I could walk on the bamboo mat above me, maybe somebody survived when the bamboo broke their fall right. or something. But uh, we got there and we found the uh, Bill Williams' body. His pants were on fire, so I had to pat that out with my hands. And uh, we dragged him away back to where the other Americans were waiting, Dunham and I. And we saw an indig laying face down in the brush near there. So we went back for him. And I remember Dunham took out his, he was taking the guy's legs, I was gonna take his chest. Now we didn't flip a coin or anything like that on this. I was closest to that end, he was closest to the other. And uh, he took out his knife, his k bar knife, and cut some brush between the indigenous legs. And the instant we tried to pick that indig up, something blew up near us. <laughs> it hit me, it blasted me in the right shoulder, it got Dunham, uh, also knocked him back. We must have been knocked back about eight feet. Whoa. And I, I might have knocked me out because I remember I was on my hands and knees. I rolled on my hands and I'm hit, I said to him. And he was on rolling on the ground coughing. He says, so am I, right? And I looked and he had blood coming out of his mouth. So I that led me to believe he was hurt more than me. So I got under his armpits and was trying to drag him uh, back to where the other people were. And then when we got about half the distance to where the other people were waiting, they came over and helped us bring him in. I removed his shirt and he had really just two wounds on him. One was in his left temple, just a small frag wound, and one just below his uh, uh, diaphragm, uh, left nipple on, oh, okay. on his chest. And uh, he kept complaining, he said, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. I told him, don't worry, if you can't breathe, I'll breathe for you, you know? But I tried giving him mouth to mouth when he said that again, and uh, unless somebody's unconscious, it can be more discomforting to them yeah. having somebody trying to blow in breath sure. not to their rhythm, you know? So anyway, I stopped that, and uh, they called for an evac evacuation helicopter, and it was, I think, from the 4th Division because it had a big red cross painted on it, and it had a jungle penetrator in it. Uh, and uh, so we got Dunham over to the uh, jungle penetrator when, when it, they lowered it down, and that pilot who ran off into the jungle straddled the arms on the penetrator, and we loaded Dunham into his arms, and he held him, carried him up to the helicopter. Otherwise, we'd have had to tie Dunham to the, to the penetrator. Right. But he really did a fantastic thing, and... Uh, I try to write him up for an award because he, you know, sure. was instrumental. But the next day I found out Dunham passed, died from his wounds. So, you know, I think 
many times, if I had been picking up the legs, would I be the one dead? <laughs> yeah, so close, but yes, so far yeah, away. Yeah, so anyway, yeah, there were times we had to get out of the helicopter and right. uh, go and get people. And uh, and then from, um, from your book, was there any of those medics missions like where you're still doing chase that kind of sticks out in your mind today or is that one of the, that crash there was one of your worst uh that was probably the worst crash uh they lost the four uh helicopter mem crew members from uh the 170th that crashed with the ship right we lost two americans dunham and uh, Appers uh not dunham uh, williams and apperson and, you know, that mission, uh, Sheridan was lost, Cherson was lost trying to recover his body. Then we lost all those people in that helicopter crash Man. to try to recover one, one sure. MIA, you know. So, and uh, there was only really one other instance that I had to get off the helicopter, and that's when... Uh, Joe Walker, uh, he was the one zero of RT California. He was one of our SOG legends, particularly on a CCC Con 2 MF will be too. Yeah. yeah Joe's well, just an amazing one zero. Oh, yeah. Uh, he, uh, I'll tell you a little thing about Joe. We, <laughs> we, we had a, uh, a team come in and uh, they had been shot out of their RON at night. Uh, and uh, it was either rifle grenades or RPGs that they fired in on them mm -hmm. and wounded some of the people on the recon team. So Joe Walker had been playing around with firing a 60 millimeter mortar. It was it had all the bells and whistles taken <laughs> off to make it lighter, but it was a basic tube. It's basic tube, a yep. mortar tube, and 60 it had millimeter. a hand firing trigger on it, so he could he fire had a trigger it. on it. Yeah, he could fire <laughs> it with a, a belt around his waist. Yeah. And uh, I remember him saying, I hope they hit me. He volunteered a week later to go back in that same target. And he said, I hope they hit me in the RON because I'll have a surprise for him. <laughs> <laughs> but that's the kind of guy Joe was. Oh, yeah. So when did you find yourself finally getting assigned to a recon team? Oh, that was uh, after I had been flying Chase about a month. Uh, towards the end of June, I was in the club and we had a, a one of our kind of famous uh, one zeros named Pappy Webb. Indeed. Clarence Webb and uh, he was a scary individual. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Pappy had a Vietnamese wife plus a wife back in the States here, right? Yeah. And uh, he lived in the little hooch outside the wire with his uh, Vietnamese wife. And he w didn't have a lot of money, even though he was an E7, right? So one evening, I bought him beers all night long in the club. And I'm whining, you know, oh, they won't let me on recon. I'm you know, doing my whining yeah, yeah. act. <laughs> and at the end of the night, Pappy looked me in the eyes. He, he called me Panar. He says, Panar, you really want to get on recon? Oh, Pappy, I want it more than anything, I told him. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> he said, I'll see what I can do. Now, I had appealed to a major who was in charge of the recon teams. Uh, when he came into the dispensary, I waited on him, and I figured you know, he could do nothing for me. He, he tried. He came back. No, you got to stay here. Right? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I figured, what's Pappy going to be able to do, you know, when the major couldn't do anything? The next day, that same major walked in the dispensary and called me over and says, move your gear into Team Texas team room. No kidding. You're on Texas. But the thing was, Texas had a one z I mean, a, a medic that wanted off recon. Mm -hmm. So I was swapping places with him. And the major explained that. He says, uh, he's got three months to go in country. Now, when he cycles out, you're going to have to go back to the dispensary. But I figured the Army, being the way it is, they'd never even remember where <laughs> I came from in three months. <laughs> but they did. But anyway, that's how I got on recon for a while. So who was the one zero? Pappy Webb was initially when I got there, right. and uh, uh, I, I was on Texas. I uh, trained with them for about three weeks, and then Team Ohio was down to one American, so I got transferred. 
after I had never been on a mission with right. uh, with Texas. I trained with them, but never never went out. Uh, they did pull a mission, but uh, because I was so green after about a week, uh, I had been on the team. Morris Paul Morris was the one one, and he and Pappy went out on a mission and. Uh, but I never got to go out with them. And it was funny because we were training the team to j parachute jump. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Static and, line? Yeah, static line out of helicopters. And uh, I remember I was really jealous of Paul Morris and have been all these years. He got to jump over in Vietnam. They did a night jump to start with, and they had a day jump the next day, and then they were qualified for whatever that was, you know, <laughs> and stuff. But uh, yeah. Uh, I really was envious of them. But I was there for their jump, their night jump, because uh, our, the guy, the uh, captain in charge of the recon teams at that time uh, uh, was Captain Ed Lassane. They called him Insane Lassane. Indeed, I've heard that name before. Yeah, and uh, anyway, he came and says, hey, will you do the medical coverage on the LZ when we do this? Sure, I said, you know. And yeah. I was there when they did the jump. I just didn't get the jump. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got on Team Ohio, and it was practice mission number one, walk out of the FOB past the Mountain Yard Village off into the woods and play soldier and stuff. And yeah. at that time, we didn't have much for enemy activity around the FOB. Later, six months later, it was a different story. But uh, mission number two was uh, the, by the way, mission number one, the one zero, his name was uh, Coton, and he got uh, malaria or something. He got a, had a bad fever. So they shipped him off somewhere. And so they brought in Tommy Carr to take the team over, and we went on a second mission. And that was good practice mission. I learned, watched the yards, how they man sure. maneuver, how they walk, what they do, try to play like you're imitating them. So that was good training. And uh, then we uh, were planning our third mission, and we had a new lieutenant showed up, and I'll only use his code name, was Rocky. <laughs> And uh, he uh, took the team over. He didn't move in the room, team room with us, though. So he was rooming with some other officer. And anyway, we had to help him carry his gear into his new room and stuff. And uh, I thought that was unusual because usually everybody moved their own yeah. gear and stuff. And he took the team over with no experience. And Carr had already had experience, you know, on oh, Recon yeah. with the... Uh, you know, on our other teams. So uh, anyway, we get ready to go out on a third walkout mission, and Rocky comes up to me and says, hey, Doc, what's the dose on these pep pills? He had green hornets. Oh, no. Yeah, I <laughs> says, sir, I says, those aren't pep pills. I says, if you have to stay awake at all costs, they'll enable you to do that. But I says, uh, you know, there's some other side effects here. Well, what's a dose on him? He says, and I says, one every 12 hours. I think what he did is after we walked out, he had taken one and he wasn't feeling any effects, so he probably popped another one or two. Oh. That night when we RON'd, about 11 o'clock, I was laying back. <laughs> I had no sleeping bag or anything. I'm just laying on the ground, yeah, laying back against typical my rucksack. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he comes over, he crawls over to me and he pokes me and says, we've got a killer team in our RON. One of our indigent dead, he says. Call into the FOB. We're only a mile from the FOB and have illumination put over us, right? Yeah, yeah. So I click the radio on, right? And I think our call sign was Diamond Head, so it was Diamond Head, <laughs> Diamond Head, this is Rocky, Rocky, over, right? And yeah. Carr says, shut that effing radio off. <laughs> Listen, he said, right? Yeah. So we're listening, and uh, yeah, he had told me one of our indigenous dead, his throat's been cut and everything, that's what Rocky told me. Uh, anyway, it became morning, there was no dead indige, it had rained all night, so he's looking around the ground. Oh, if it hadn't rained, there'd be tracks coming through here. They came through here last night. He was hallucinating from being oh, on yeah. the Green Hornets. We had Our mission was to go out and do a med cap on a village out there where we heard there was malaria. So we went and did the med cap. There was no malaria, but a lot of the kids had 
like infected cuts and scratches. So I gave out a bunch of bars of soap and uh, I think I may have given some uh, uh, erythromycin or something to the village chief and uh, through the interpreter telling them it'll only work if the village chief gives it out, you know, because yeah. you don't want him to lose face or anything, you know. So anyway, then we continued the mission and Rocky's going wild. He's going to every termite mound we came to. No. And he's taking a stick and he's poking it into the holes underneath it. And he looks around and it says, they hide weapons under these things, right? <laughs> and I was looking at the uh, uh, car and he's looking at me. And one of the indig tapped his temple, which is the sign of Dinky Dow. Buku Dinky know? Dow. Yeah. <laughs> so when he, Tommy Carr told Rocky, I'll get us into a place where nobody will get in, come through there at night. So we crawled into a bamboo thicket. And we, we even to, to lay down, we had to quietly pick sticks out of the way so we could lay down. So Tommy Carver had had our little uh, areas cleared and Rocky immediately fell asleep. Of course, he hadn't slept for two days now, you know. Yeah, yeah. So he laid and crashed right away, right? And just before it was getting dark, he starts going, ah, ah, and crashing through the, all the bamboo and cracking it and stuff. I said to myself, if we were over in a hot area in Laos, now we're all dead. That, you know, that kind of actions you just don't do. And uh, so we got back from the mission after that. They, you know, rained the whole time. We were all soaked. So we got back to the, uh, um, compound and the guy that was overseeing at that time the uh, recon teams came to me and said uh, get your gear ready I'm sending Rocky out with a hatchet platoon tomorrow and I want him I, I want him to get some experience with a hatchet platoon and I told him I says I never want to go out with that man again and he said why and I explained to him exactly what had happened and uh, so he says, well, tell him your gear's all wet and I'll get somebody else, you know. So then he ran to Tommy Carr right away. To, <sighs> and Tommy Carr says, yeah, that's what happened. He says, I wasn't going to say anything about it because I figured everybody would think it's, uh, you know, I'm just mad because I lost the one zero s slot to him. So he says, but yeah, that's what happened, right? So anyway, I'm going to Chow and uh, I'm coming back from Chow and I bump into Rocky. And he says to me, hey, how come you're not coming out with me tomorrow? What's the matter, you chicken? And I says to him, yes, sir, I'm chicken. <laughs> no, no, no. He says, I saw how you handled yourself out there. Why won't you come out with me? I says, if I told you, you'd only get ticked off, sir. Yeah, yeah. And he says, no, I won't. No, I won't. Tell me. Tell me. Right. And so I told him, I have absolutely no confidence in you as a recon one zero. And I think you're going to get people needlessly killed. And I don't want to be one of them. Whoa. <laughs> and so then I went to the showers to take my shower yeah. after the mission. I'm getting out of the shower. Here comes uh, the captain, Gail. Oh. Uh, he says to me, I thought I told you to tell him that your gear was all what I said. I did, but I says he wouldn't accept it for an answer and demanded another answer, right? Yeah. He says, uh, how's he supposed to gain confidence if you tell him you don't have confidence in him? <laughs> I says, sir, this isn't the place to come and gain confidence. If you don't have confidence in yourself to begin with, you shouldn't be here. Yeah. And, oh, he said, you ever disobey another order from me and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, under my breath, I said some stuff with, <laughs> not out loud, you know. Indeed. Like, uh, but anyway, that was. The uh, officer corps. Yeah, yeah. So, uh Anyway, Tommy Carr took the team back and stuff, and we ran a couple decent missions. We ended up uh, destroying an enemy bivouac area that was in Vietnam. Uh, was that close to the border area, or is that near no, it was Ben Head or anything like that? It, it, where we had a radio relay site on a mountain between like Contum and Cambodia. Not Leghorn. No, the Leghorn was out in Laos. This was uh, called Sledgehammer. Oh, right, right. And I forgot sled, about that But one. Sledgehammer, when I was over there, everybody says, oh, it's in Cambodia. It was not in Cambodia. It was in Vietnam, but it was a prominent 
peak yeah. that could make good radio contact with the people running in Cambodia. Yeah. Uh, but it was just between that and Kantum. And uh, we found an, a grave, an enemy grave there in the bivouac area. It was like three uh, banana leaf covered structures that could probably sleep maybe a company of people. There were like three structures and stuff. So we radioed back and uh, said, hey, we found something. So they order us, move a mile up that hillside, right? Then we got up there, call artillery in on it, right? So we called artillery in on it. Then, of course, when you're done with that, it's go back and see if we hit anything. <laughs> no, you had to do a bomb damage assessment. Yeah, we EDA. had to go back Yeah, after. And then it was dig up that grave. Maybe maybe that's a cache of weapons or something, you know? <laughs> we dug it up. It was, it was a dead body in there and... Uh, so anyway, that that was uh, a fairly decent mission. And my last experience on recon was Tommy Carr was too lazy to run the, we, we used to run sweeps around the compound on nightly security. Right. Well, it, we had a road that ran through the compound and separated it into east and west. And one recon team would go out about a mile, half a mile, and run an arc around the compound back to the road, and the other would do the same thing on the opposite side. So I got my, Tommy says, I want you to get experience being a one zero, right? So he said, <laughs> you take the team. And we had a new- uh, At night? Well, it was dusk. dusk it yeah. wasn't dark out at the time, right? So anyway, so uh, we had a, a new, uh, guy on the team luke dove he in fact he's of course. a member here and uh he's an attorney in yeah well, he days. was our platoon leader training group oh okay yeah from yeah. mississippi uh, yeah. yeah 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 well anyway luke was my one two when was i that right? was active <laughs> yeah i'm a spec <laughs> four he's an e6 yeah yeah but i'm in charge right so we get out there to do this sweep and all of a sudden we hear pow somebody's firing off a shot Wow, another shot. So uh, we radioed back to the uh, FOB. Hey, we're hearing shots out here. We'll go see what it, uh, who's shooting, you know? So me being inexperienced, I said to the interpreter, we go catch him. And he said something to the point man. The point man starts running in the direction of the shots, right? Everybody else starts following. I'm the, I'm, wait, I mean, go slow. You know, I meant to say, but I never said that, right? I learned then you better spe be specific when you tell these guys you want to do oh something. Oh, my God. Anyway, when I finally caught up to them, they had the guy that was doing the shooting. It was some poor old mountain yard up there that I think was on the local. Uh, uh, militia militia yeah, yeah. he had sh birds in his shirt that was his supper right <laughs> so anyway we radio back we got the guy he's got a bunch of birds in his shirt we'll bring him back in for questioning man we ruined that guy's whole day <laughs> we brought him back in and that was my one experience at being a one zero. <laughs> oh my god well then also in base um after they closed fob one they rotated some teams that came south. Yes, they did. And amongst those was uh, uh, RT Louisiana with John Walton. Yes. And he was one of several people that you had a very interesting uh, medical class of graduates that came out of that he class. He was in that class of 43 medics that all volunteered to go to Vietnam. But, you know, after we – after. Willoughby and I got back to Bragg. We told everybody, Mrs. Alexander really exists and can get you there. And everybody was calling her on the phone after that, you know, <laughs> bugging her. In yeah. fact, Brian Laux called her up and says, I want to go to SOG. She says, we don't say that over the phone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. So, yeah, with a... If you want me to jump ahead a little bit, uh, I can continue where John Walton got transferred back. Sure. Uh, yeah, when they closed Fubai down, I think it was. Correct. John's team came down, and John got assigned out at the Mountain Yard Camp, which was about a couple miles uh, south of the FOB2. Right. Uh, or CCC, I think, at that time. That's part of the transition at that time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So anyway, he was out at the yard camp, when he had about a month left to go, it, it was beginning of March, he moved his gear up and was gonna move in with myself and Brian Lauchs, another medic. 
And I figured, man, this might be a record of some kind. We got three medics who graduated in the same class, a roommate for their last month in Vietnam. You know, maybe. still alive. Yeah, and still alive. You know, so. Uh, uh, but it it never came to be because uh, uh, John went and got. He liked to play poker. Right. And he went to the club and got in an all night poker game. And so I left the door unlatched and uh, um, went to sleep. Laux was sleeping in his bunk, and we started getting some incoming. I could always tell the incoming by the sand tinkling off the metal roof. Sure. Uh, After impact. Right, after impact. Sand (laughs) would be sprinkling down everywhere. And it was, I could hear the sand tinkling uh, on the roof. So I said to Laux, get under your bunk, it's incoming. Well, Laux figured I better get to the wall, so, because the siren started wailing too. So he starts pulling his pants on, sitting on his bunk. And I looked up at the, the open door and said, "Uh oh, I should, maybe I ought to get up there real quick and go latch that because I don't want a sapper squad to throw over satchel charges." In yeah, the like room. we had at the at yeah the before up happened, on August twenty third, right. sixty eight. So that I, while I was contemplating whether I should do that, I didn't. The door was gone a second later. A B forty RPG went right through our room, uh, blew the door off the the hinges and. Uh, Uh, We had a double two-by-four jam on the right side of the door away from the hinges. That got blown out. We had about a three-foot hole in the uh, center divider. It was masonite like that separated our rooms from the rooms on the other side of the building. And on the fire concrete wall, which went up about four feet, there was an eight-inch hole from the shape charge where it exited the building. Yeah. And... uh, Luckily, there wasn't room for both John and myself under my bunk where I was hiding. (laughs) (laughs) So he was lucky. That was the luckiest poker game I think he ever was in. Yeah, because he was playing poker on the other side of the highway. Exactly, right. Yep. So he he survived that one. And uh, I can remember talking to him. The night after that, I was afraid to sleep in the room because I figured uh, they repaired the room in one day. The only way you could tell something hit was the corrugated metal would just boat up above the door in a couple spots where the blast right. had uh, meant the you know the steel roof there it uh, dented it up. Uh, but they repaired it that day, and I I didn't sleep in the room. I slept out on the wall, and uh, <laughs> uh, I had an indigenous sleeping bag. But it yeah. was it uncomfortable on a sleeping on a skid? You know, basically was the bottom of the bunker and so then I uh, talked to John and I he says well, I think the chances of a rocket hitting the exact same spot are pretty slim or something like that oh, yeah. I figured well you, he's always you, playing the odds yeah you know the odds so so I went back to the room but <laughs> and by that time John had been running missions out of FOB1 yeah came yeah. down by that time he was the one zero yeah yeah yeah, and which well, he got the silver star. A he got was awarded a silver star up there. Yeah, for August third, with Tom yeah. Cunningham had his yeah. leg blown off. Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, you know it was funny because I, uh, John Walton, we were all derosing at the same time. Right, and uh, we all flew together to Natrang, where we signed the non-disclosure. Agreements. You signed it after the tour of duty. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. When huh. we left, they yeah, yeah. debriefed us at uh, Natrang, and they told us, "Those of you in the special projects, you've trained mountain yards. That's your cover story for what you did over here." You know, and so uh, I remember it was ten thousand dollars fine. 10 years in jail or both, <laughs> but I don't remember whether it was 20 years or 10 years. 20. Keep your mouth shut or whatever. I remember the 20. So okay, my, all right. My address at home was 20 West Paul Elvis. Like, okay, all right. So it stuck. Yeah, and uh, most of us stuck by the non-disclosure statements that I know of. Uh, I know of one case where somebody didn't, in fact, they're in the Pentagon Papers for blabbing about us doing missions in Laos and stuff yeah. like that. But uh, So you served your three years? 
I and served. Then, I served two years and eight months in the military. They kicked me out because I had less than 150 days. They threw me out in civilian <laughs> life. <laughs> so where'd you go from there, Joe? Uh, you mean in civilian life? Yeah. Oh, I uh, tried teaching, and the kids ate me up. Uh, <laughs> it was different from when I graduated. You know, the things that students were saying to me. Yeah. You'd have been home for a month or, or there's so. There was an attitude change. Yeah, there was an attitude change. And I was told in one instance a young lady said something to me. And when we got to the office and were together with the principal, she's, oh, he thought I said something, but I said something else, you know. And, of course, neither one of us said what she really said. <laughs> Foxtrot something or other. Indeed, yeah, you yeah. Know? And, uh, <laughs> uh, so... Uh, when she left, he dismissed her, and he said to me, can't you look the other way once in a while? She comes from a rough family. You know, I practically wanted to tell him, I can look the other way all the time if that's what you want, but the superintendent of schools writes me up because I got a kid looking out the window. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so after four months of teaching, I quit and went back to working in the machine shop. And you know, it was funny because I had a job piecework in a machine shop making, I was making like 250 an hour and uh, $130 a week. My pay as a teacher was $102.50 a week. Whoa. <laughs> but my, I was married at the time. My first wife liked that because it was more prestigious than being a, Grease monkey pulling down a drill press <laughs> handle all day. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. Wow. So anyway, uh, but I have no regrets about serving in Vietnam or I'd do it all over again. Well, and as a medic too, when you would go out into those, um, you would go out to the local villages. Yeah, and you, caps, that's a major, yeah, because yeah, that's yeah. a major win the hearts and minds kind of thing yeah. because the medics are the people that establish the report wise children and any of the men that are sick they're able to um, rebound heal correct and um, you know the via Cong would never do anything like that and that's a whole special area yeah not only is it good medically for the villages but it's psyops as best yep. in, a, in a really sincere way yeah it's amazing and that's where the medics training could be everything from delivering babies yep. to helping cure syphilis yeah. <laughs> I got to uh, a company uh, hatchet platoon to recover a wiretap on one mission. And that was really an interesting mission because we got really close to a bunch of NBA. Uh, we, we took in... Uh, was this Cambodia or Laos? Uh, it was Cambodia. And uh, a recon team found a wire and put a wiretap. It was like a suitcase size device where they'd clip into the... Oh, the, the big one. Yeah. Yeah, and, there's uh, several different sides. We always carried a small cassette recorder. Oh, okay. And periodically, a plane would fly over and it would relay whatever messages had come over to the plane, but it had stopped transmitting, so they put in the hatchet platoon to go recover it. And when we got in there, we would, uh, inserted about three ridge lines north of that, three oh, wow. hill, hills yeah. north of that. And as we were going up the, the side of it, we hit a trail with, had bunkers built along the side of it periodically, uh, and you know, well-used trail. And we're sneaking up the trail and we could hear people cutting wood off to the side and talking. And so we, the 30 of us have crept past uh, him up to the top of the hill. When we got to the top of the hill, we heard this strange sound like, I had crack. I had crack. And we're wondering, what the heck? All I could picture is somebody with a piece of shattered bamboo do, do, practicing karate chops on it. <laughs> but so we sent some people, you know, Martial a couple of people up to see what it yeah. was. And it was a whole bunch of NVA out in the open doing drill with their rifles. The higher was the command and the crack, crack, crack was the people slapping their rifles. And so the, the lieutenant that was leading us said, we'll turn around and go back down the trail the way we came. When the word got to the end of the, the you know, the American and the 
the, at the, the, eyes at the tail element. element. At the tail element. Yeah. The guy came forward and says, hey, we heard those guys saying, we'll get them when they come down. So we angled off that ridge line and went into a like a little valley with yeah. a small brook in it and up the other side of the hill and stopped there and started calling in artillery on that hilltop. We, we, got, we had a covey fly over us. In fact, in Stars and Stripes, it was written up in Stars and Stripes as being in Vietnam. <laughs> and the guy's name was Morton, and he was with the headhunters, some uh, group of uh, covey, you know, a, the bird dog pilots. Is that right? Yeah, that uh, his name was, <clears throat> last name was Morton. Yeah. And when our uh, commo guy talked to him, I think Luke Dove might have been the cubby rider that day. Oh, no kidding. With him. Yeah. Because Luke re recalls when they were, they saw a whole bunch of people on the ground doing drill, like. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, uh, we called in airstrikes for almost a whole day, and what a show that was. Uh, they got fast movers from some uh, aircraft carrier to come in and expend 500 pound bombs. How was the Navy? Yeah. Were they good? Well, they got one of the 337 Mike Mikes that was popping at them, and there we are about 300 meters probably from where that enemy encampment was. Yeah. And uh, you could tell when the jet was coming in to make a run because it was, uh, you'd hear boom, 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 the 37 Mike Mikes, and there were three of them you know, wow. simultaneously going up, plus a 51 caliber, plus all the AKs up on that hilltop was started shooting. Then they'd stop. And then there was like about a few second pause and there's about boom where the bomb would go off. And uh, the, the Morton reported that the, that's more en more enemy he's ever seen out in the open over there. Really? Yeah. And so we called airstrikes in all day on them, and uh, uh, then it got dark. We RON right where we had were calling the strikes in from. The next morning, we tried calling an airstrike. There was no return fire. So then they send us go find the wiretap. Now that's two ridge <laughs> line, two two hills south of us now, right? So yeah, sure. We got down there, and uh, the one of the. Uh, people from the recon team that had planted the thing found the spot where they had put it but it was gone evidently the enemy found it and uh there was no comma wire there anymore either to to tap right and just inside of there there was a, a road like a dirt road that's uh skirted the uh, border mm -hmm. uh the cambodian border so we were on the Vietnamese side of that road about you know 20 meters in the jungle, and we followed it north to where we found another little side road going up, and it went to that hilltop that we called all the airstrikes in on. And we found the, they had three 37 Mike Mike positions. They were all gone. They moved everything out at night. And uh, there were three 37 Mike Mikes laid out in the form of a triangle. And if you can figure, figure those three points where the guns were, if you drew like trenches in towards the middle, like spokes on a wheel almost, uh, that's in, in each one of those spokes, there was a little tunnel dug off to the side where the enemy could hide during the airstrikes. And we had a 50, uh, 500 pound bomb crater that half overlapped the uh, 37 Mike Mike pit. And we found the recoil spring from the 37 Mike Mike. That evidently <laughs> got destroyed. And uh, uh, I picked up one of the empty 37 Mike Mike casings for a souvenir and uh, put it in my pack. And evidently they had a barber shop there because we found human hair in several places. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> yeah, no, I think wow. it was probably people got wounded real bad, you know. Sure. But... Uh, uh, that was that was a good operation. We got really close to the enemy, and then we got us extracted uh, the, late that same second day. So, so you went in with a full platoon on that. Yep, 
Yeah, we had a platoon to go and retrieve that. We never got the wiretap back, but we got in close to the enemy and we put some hurt on them because oh, yeah. uh, of the airstrikes. And uh, we started walking artillery up the, with the trail we had walked up to to get to that hilltop sure, where sure. we heard the people chopping wood. And uh, I was never impressed with artillery uh, over there. It was three rounds at a time, boom, boom, boom. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, is that right? Yeah, my, my you know, uh, on a recon mission with Tommy Carr, we had called in artillery. And I remember he says, okay, fire around. They fired around. And then finally he told me, okay, tell them fire for effect. And I figured the whole valley was going to go up in gunfire. <laughs> Three rounds at a time coming in and like a minute in between for the next salvo to come in and... I was disappointed. Hollywood has got a lot better <laughs> artillery than the Army does. <laughs> so what did they use, like 155s and 175? Yeah, I think they were yeah. 150, and they were firing <clears throat> out, out of, I think it was Play Durang. Uh, well, they had a lot of action with that A-camp down there, so they had plenty of experience with uh, artillery there, maybe yeah. a little yeah. bit more thorough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I got to a company one SLAM operation. In fact, you know, in uh, uh, SLAM is search, locate, annihilate, monitor. I don't know what the heck the monitor, who monitors, whether it's... Like a BDA after you're done. Yeah. Assuming you wipe everybody out and you're yeah, in a good position. I always figured maybe you get wiped out and then yeah. who monitors? <laughs> yeah, because those SLAM missions drew a lot of attention from the NBA. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, this was 14 to 19 uh, November of 68. Uh, the slam that I was involved That's with. That's probably one of the first ones, right? It was the only one, according to government reports I have, that was conducted in 1968. Right. The only slam operation. And it consisted of like four company size operations, I don't know, four or five platoon size, and 13 recon team operations. That started with Joe Walker on a prisoner snatch and his uh, trigger man, his gun uh, didn't fire when he went to to trigger the uh, ambush on the enemy. Yeah. And the enemy had grenades mounted on boards on their chest. And they also had an RPD machine gun with them. And that opened up and they started peeling the grenades off the chest two at a time. And uh, they hit Joe's 1-1, Terry Brents, and he got a bad head wound. And that was a time when I had to get off the helicopter to help get right. him loaded on and uh, that after they in order to secure the LZ for that they put in a, a hatchet platoon so now we've got a hatchet platoon and all but one of a recon team in there and uh, instead of pulling them out it became oh see what else you can find you know roam around and, and explore oh is that right oh yeah <laughs> that was on the when we pulled the wounded guy out it was the 10th of november and uh, on the 14th uh the hatchet platoon got overrun with joe walker's team they overran him really and yep and on the 14th when i got into the dispensary uh they asked me is your gear ready to go uh a report to the choppers they're going to put in a company to to get out the overrun platoon and uh, uh joe walker got wounded that day and uh we had a, a black and spec five named bryant and uh he got badly wounded in there and uh when they got the first half of the company, and I went in with the first half of the company. It took like eight helicopters, two flights from Dr. Toe to get all those people sure. out there, about 120 people. And uh, so when we got on the ground, I remember going over to Joe Walker and says, boy, if anybody's still alive up at your RON site across the river, they probably need medical attention. He said, I'm going up there, right? He just walked up to the uh, captain in charge of the slam and said, I'm going up to the RON site. And he headed across the river and Bob Howard was there and Bob says I'll go and so he joined us and uh, we found Bryant there were five dead in ditch and they had dug foxholes the platoon had uh, the previous night and uh, we found Bryant still alive in his foxhole but he had like 19 wounds in his body 
19, he's still he, alive? Yeah, he had one black and blue streak running on his forehead for like right above his eyes. And he said he was conscious when I was putting bandages on all those holes and he said in the morning the NVA came through and shot all of the dead. And he says they shot him in the head. He, he says I just played dead. Whoa. And uh, we ended up getting him out of there. I put an IV in him because when I opened up his shirt, it had a about a quart of blood in there uh, with a big clots formed in it. Yeah, yeah. So we got him out of there and everything. And now they've got a whole you know whole bunch of us in there. They got maybe 130 people. And I figured, hey, we we're successful. We pulled out the the survivors of the platoon, and they're going to pull us out now. They had different thoughts. Hey, we got a fresh company out there. <laughs> Let's raise hell on the Ho Chi Minh yeah, Trail. And they had been sh popping at us with 37 mic mics from about two miles probably to our southwest. So then it became, oh, let's go see if we can attack those. They'll have to stand and fight if we attack those. You know, they won't yeah. be able to run away on us. So uh, it became a, a quite a quite an operation. Uh, I didn't bring, you know, I smoked cigarettes back then, and I ran out of cigarettes after about the first day. <laughs> <laughs> we got hit with rifle grenades fired in us. Uh, that was on the 14th we got inserted. On the 16th, they hit us with rifle grenades. We took about 15 people wounded. Uh, about 11 of them were enough to... Uh, so at that point, were you working with the Air Force? Some of the traffic would back up on the highway, then the Air Force would come in and attack the backed-up traffic. That, at that one point, south. we walked right down one of the major branches of Highway 96. So when you walked down 96, were you smoking cigarettes? I mean, the hatchet force yeah. is so much different than Why recon. Not? Yeah. Why not? They know you're there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and uh, uh, I remember what, you know, what they oh were doing God. is yeah. our, the guy leading us, uh, in fact, the guy leading us, his name was Tom Yeager. He was at the SOAR just recent this right. past year. Our past reunion a couple of days ago, the end yep. of last night. Yeah, yes. and he... Uh, he was also on the Sante prison raid back in 1970. He was led in one November of the, 70. Yeah, in in uh, he led one of the assault uh, elements with Dick Meadows. Uh, I think Dick Meadows ran one assault element. He had the other one or something. And of course, uh, and Dick Meadows is still the all-time legend oh, out of, out of absolutely, FOB2, who absolutely. had what 12 or 13 captured yeah. POWs oh, yeah. he brought oh, back. Oh, yeah. He, I think he holds the record for most prisoners taken of anybody. Absolutely. Just yeah. a crazy never. Oh, yeah. No, he was he was a legend in his own time. Absolutely. There, That's before yeah. then he gets promoted to uh, officer be, and later yeah. CCM Direct was commission. The, uh, yeah. Yes, recon uh, team, uh, company commander. Yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, my God. And uh, in fact, on this mission, Bob Howard uh, was put in for the Medal of Honor on this slam operation, but it was downgraded to a Silver Star. Wow. But so that's I, one of the first two rejections then. So this yeah. is because you had the heavy contact. By now, you got the NVA's attention. They're coming yeah. at you with yeah. heavy weapons now, more platoon or yeah. squad size. Well, we, we needed a resupply, right? Because yeah. everybody was out of cigarettes. Stuff. Of course, they're really important stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, they uh, told us that it, that was the uh, 57th was uh, Assault Helicopter Company. And uh, I, I've talked since to, to the guy who was dropping those two bundles to us. They, we got the word, they're going to drop two bundles to you and you'll have a mortar in the resupply. And we're thinking, we got enough to lug without lugging a mortar, base plate, and all that kind of yeah. stuff, you know? So they dropped one bundle, and it landed probably a half a mile away. <laughs> the second one was maybe 100 meters from our where we were located. So Howard and some people went to retrieve that, right? They brought the bundle back, and it was a wooden crate it set on it, mortar ammunition. And I remember somebody commenting, great. We got the mortar ammunition to carry, and Charlie's got the mortar. <laughs> we opened it up, and it was all full of cigarettes. Till <laughs> Everybody was happy. Yeah. You know, my first cigarette I lit up, I got dizzy from it because I hadn't smoked for a couple of days, you know. <laughs> 
You know, I forgot how difficult life could be on a hatchet for us. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, mission. we needed then to still be resupplied with ammunition and stuff. So sure. we moved on to another open area and oh, maybe 100 yards long, 50 yards wide. And we set up a perimeter around that open area and they flew in and gave us water in these plastic bags. They were maybe a six inch in diameter and five feet long. Uh, a bunch of those bladders they dumped off. They gave us ammunition, food. Uh, that's where I first started to learn to eat the PIR rations. <laughs> sure, the indig rations. Yeah, yeah exactly. They're... They were good, I liked them. Me too, uh, they're but fabulous. During the resupply, uh, when they dropped off one of the helicopter loads, one of the mount, uh, we got hit on the LZ, and I was helping carry stuff up to where we were going to RON shortly off the LZ, and uh, one of the yards got shot right through the elbow. Oh! And uh, uh, they had put a like a, a tourniquet on his arm, right? So I went up and put a pressure dressing on it and tried to. Uh, I figured he's going to lose his arm if that tourniquet stays on all night because it was getting oh, yeah. close to dark. So uh, I put a pressure dressing on it, put his arm in a sling, and uh, I stayed up all night. Every 10 minutes or 15 minutes, I'd check the, the dressing, and about oh maybe 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, what I used for backing to put pressure on the wound was an, uh, a combat dressing still in its plastic wrapper. Right. That had slipped off the ties that were holding it down so his dressing was all wet from blood. He was bleeding, so I had to put one on in the dark. And no sterile technique till all by feel. <laughs> okay, there's the bone, put it here, put it there, now tie it. And I stayed up all night taking care of him, and uh, we got him out at first light, and uh, then we continued on and got ambushed in a big open area. The Hatcher Force got ambushed. Yeah, so this when two, you're on the two road. Two companies of NVA ambushed us in that. So you're on a road at the time? No, we we had we were coming through the jungle, but it you know it became because they could tell from the noise. Scrubby bamboo to oh, yeah. tall grass to knee-high grass. Not triple canopy like no. the layoffs. And then Highway 96, or part of it, went right through and went to the left. But there was a little side road that headed more in the direction of the 37 Mike Mikes that had been shooted from. So we started following that. Yeah. And when we got almost to the other side, uh, Lieutenant Yeager told... Uh, Bob Howard, and uh, uh, we had a first lieutenant named Lee Swain, and he told them uh, to uh, kind of uh, take point, but he didn't want both of them on point because that was his that was his company sergeant and his one of his uh, top platoon leaders, you know. So, but they they were up front and uh, they saw people enemy moving in the wood line. Mm -hmm. And so they, uh, I guess uh, Lee Swain said to Bob Howard, uh, you, do, do, should we initiate it now? And one of the two of them says, yeah, let's do it now, right? So they dropped down and started shooting at the figures in the wood line. And a rifle grenade came out and went off right between Swain, Swain's feet when he was laying down. And it took off one of his ankles and left it hanging by the Achilles tendon. And the other one, it was like you ripped a big chunk of his calf out. Um, and so uh, I was near the end of the column. They always stuck the medic down back so he couldn't see anything. <laughs> and uh, I went to the, uh, <clears throat> got an American about three mountain yards away from me and says, are we in contact? I fired a couple of magazines. I didn't see any return fire coming, so I said, Asked him, are we in contact? He says, no, nah, I think we're just having a mad minute. He says, let's go up front, see what's going on. The front of the column was really in contact. Then we, we ended up calling. So you get that stretched out that far, you couldn't you couldn't hear the the noise from the contact. Yeah, yeah. I'll be darned. Yeah, and uh, so anyway, then when I got to Lieutenant Swain, I remember looking down and seeing the pearly white bone ends of his ankle bone separated and he just being held on by the Achilles tendon I almost fainted to 
I believe it. That's a I sight. Had to, I had to tense up all my muscles to keep from fainting. I figured if you faint, you might start a chain reaction. Everybody's <laughs> going to faint, and we're all going to get killed. <laughs> Time to toughen up. Yeah. Oh my God. Then, so, so you had so you treated. How do you? What do you do with a severed foot? I'll tell you. You know, normally what I should have had done is splint that foot. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, but hey, we got. We were calling in CBU at that time. The cluster bomb units. Yeah, and we had trees within our right inside our perimeter where the tops of them were being blown off by the CBU because we had uh, the cubby could see that we had enemy massing to attack us just in a ways into the tree there were other right, open the tree areas line. so yeah. would that be like by there is a double canopy uh if it's not yeah, triple no that wasn't triple canopy no, no. at all in that area uh might have even been like bamboo and stuff or just single canopy but you know not just grass or sure uh, or elephant grass it was taller than that uh but um we uh, uh, then we had to try to get somebody in to medevac uh, uh, Lieutenant Swain because he need, and we also had another uh, uh, person who when when he was kind of he had moved into the wood line a little bit when the uh, uh, spads dropped the, the CBU, CBU right and he got wounded from that and when I because uh, I was treating a, a mountain yard and this yard came up to me and says, American wounded. So I showed the, guy, the guy's friend who brought the wounded mountain yard I was treating how to hold pressure on his, the whole side of his face was like peeled down. So I showed him how to, I, I eased it back up with a dressing under it and put my hand over his hand and showed him how I had to press. And so I come back, you know, and then I followed the other yard. We found a uh, SFC named Dickerson, who I had seen in the club, but never really talked to or met. And he was on his haunches saying, when I got to him, I says, it's the medic. I, he says, I can't see, I can't see, right? So I said, uh, we're gonna bring you where the, where the other wounded are, right? So the yard picked up his weapon. I grabbed him under one armpit the yard under the other armpit and we dragged him letting his feet drag facing rearward he was and right. we brought him into our perimeter i remember when I, we were bringing him into the perimeter i could see you know where our people were spread out i could see machine gun bullets kicking up the dust in the middle of our perimeter no kidding <laughs> yeah and uh so uh anyway the, then we had needed a medevac so it was the uh 57th that was supporting us once again sure and this pilot named Carl Hoke uh, tried to get in to get Lieutenant Swain out, and uh, he got shot down. The enemy moved up with uh, a track vehicle with, 50, with a 51 caliber on it and shot Carl Hoke, was the name of the pilot uh, from oh. the 57th, shot yeah. his helicopter down. And the chase medic was on it, a guy named Tony Dorff. He used to be a member of the organization, but passed away not long ago. But uh, uh, anyway, he got shot down, so Howard and Tom Yeager went and guided them back into our perimeter. And uh, um, then luckily, just before it got dark, we did get two helicopters in to get out the most critically wounded. Because I figured, man, I can't treat all. We so had what like, happened to Dickerson if he couldn't, could he really not see or was it just the being stunned from the stunned, moment I of think, the explosion? I was, concerned, CBU. I, was, I was concerned most about the wound he had in his chest. Sure. And I watched it for a while to see if it was frothing blood like, but I didn't see anything like that, but I treated it like a sucking wound, chest wound. Took the plastic from sure. the combat wrapper taped it to his chest and uh, uh, so anyway, I, he, he survived all right and uh, luckily uh, the guy who tried to do the resupply of the, by dropping the bundles to us the day before, he's the one that came in and ended up getting Lee Swain out and Bob Howard and myself and Tom Yeager were the ones who carried Lieutenant Swain to the uh, uh, chopper and got him on there and they got out and uh, then it was uh, re ready to get dark, so we had to spend the night in there and camp out. 
there was a ring of foxholes, right, in the yards had dug. And I noticed nobody was using one of the foxholes. I went over to it, and there was an unexploded CBU on the bottom of it. Oh. <laughs> so, right, this American, the one next, says, oh, come over here with me, you know. So I went over with him. We both got into that little mountain yard foxhole. <laughs> and w- if we'd have been hit, we couldn't move enough to even shoot out of it, you know. Yeah, yeah. So we laid on the back of it at night when it got dark because we had a spooky come in and, we got out our strobe lights, put them down in the foxholes, uh, and uh, to outline our sure. perimeter. And smart boy, I'll tell you, when you're down on the ground, those traces uh, seem to give the appearance that they're coming straight down at you. But right at the last minute, they seem to bend and veer off into the <laughs> <laughs> terrain around the side. <laughs> but we had a, a good. We had air support all night long, continually. Oh, wow. And one of the airstrikes from one of the jets with hard bombs hit an enemy ammo dump. And there were secondary explosions for about three or four hours till. And in between, That's it was. better than the 4th of July. It was like a popcorn popper going off all the AK <laughs> round. Pop, 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 boom. The sky would you light any good up. flares and, or anything like that? Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, but. Uh, I'll tell you, you know, I was in my fox hole. I said, boy, we hit something big, yeah. good. Then I says, boy, are the NBA going to be ticked off now? They're going to come <laughs> down here and kill us, right? <laughs> I prayed that night, man. I promised to be a better person if they let us get out of there, all of us. And uh, anyway, we survived into the morning, and uh, uh, we took 45 wounded on that operation, and... Uh, a number of them were critical, you know, but uh, uh, that was the other. That was the biggest operation I was involved with. And how did Swain end up? Did he did he survive all that? Oh yeah, he he was at the reunion here. Both no. he and Tom Yeager were here. Really? <laughs> yep. Then we're what we're referring to is because this is being recorded on um, October twenty second. From October the 18th through the 21st, yeah, uh, into this morning uh, was the Special Operations Association annual reunion, a 45th annual reunion, which you and I have attended for quite a few years now. Exactly, yeah. and uh, so that's where they made it. I, I didn't realize they were here. Yeah, and that's quite a story. And again, the medics, our SF medics, bring them back. Yeah, well. Uh, I remember I first met you after joining the Special Ops Association here. Indeed. Yeah, I joined in 92, came to my first SOAR in 95. And I used to read, uh, you know, at at the beginning, you didn't read much (laughs) about SOG. Right. And there was a book uh, that I subscribed to, Soldier of Fortune. That's a magazine. Magazine, right. Well, book I called magazines books. But uh, (laughs) anyway, the... uh, uh, there was uh, uh, someone named Isaac Statz that was writing these articles about SOG in this magazine. And uh, I said, gee, I never, I never knew anybody named Statz that was in there. But uh, then when I joined, I met you here. Yeah. And uh, you had in the 90s, I think, started putting some things in with your full name. Yeah, your real name. yeah that's right. Yeah, is John Stryker Meyer. Uh, tilt to all of us and uh small it was it was shortly after that i found out isaac stats and (laughs) was the nom de gere striker meyer were one and the same (laughs) small world yeah indeed and that's when i started telling you you gotta put all those stories together into a book (laughs) tilt and then after i started doing that i said joe you gotta put your stories into a book (laughs) and so speaking about your books the very first book that you co-authored with Bob Dumont. Yeah. The first one was titled Sog Medics, Stories from Vietnam and Over the Fence. Correct. So that one was printed by Paladin, which then- Paladin Press. Paladin Press. Yeah. And then um, you did a second edition that you added some more information, expanded the, it's an expanded edition, literally. Yeah. Was that by Paladin or did you have to go no, somewhere else for that? Uh, we had to go somewhere else. Paladin went out of business and when they did, they turned all of the rights for the book over to back to Bob and I. And so Bob had uh, some contacts with the Casemate publishers. 
and they did it. Bob did a book with Case Mate with one of my medics classmates called Boxy. Oh, uh, is that right? Which is about a medic that yes. served on an A team at Loch Ninn. Yes. So uh, anyway, the historic battle locked yeah. in. So he had an in now with Casemate, and uh, uh, so they redid the book. And of course, there's been changes because in the first book, I would have says the helicopter pilot came in and got shot down. Now I can say uh, Carl Hoke of the uh, 57th <laughs> came <Yeah>. in, <laughs> and I even know his crew members have been added to the new book. You know, so sure. it's trying to make it a little more historically accurate. Indeed, and then, uh, so you did the second edition, and so now you and Bob are working on a third book? Yeah, and this is the most difficult one because while Joe Parner, the medic, was on his second practice mission, other people were doing real missions where they were getting awards, getting shot up in, in real missions. I'm trying to tell their story, but it's much more difficult when you weren't there. Indeed. <laughs> it helps to have that firsthand on the yeah. ground experience. Yeah, and it's been a slow progress on it because, uh, uh, you know, sometimes you get to somebody with questions, and, you know, that isn't the priority of their life, your book and stuff like that. So sure. it may take you six months to get the answers to those questions. And uh, Welcome to the world of book writing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and we work from award orders a lot and as much as we can and sure. stuff to try to fact check things. And, no, uh, you've been very good about that, I know, from firsthand experience. Yeah, well, I, it's important to me to get it right, you know. <laughs> Clearly. Um, we're at that point, uh, Joe, where I think uh, we're close to wrapping it up here. Is there any okay. final thoughts or anything as you look back on your one-year tour of duty in SOG and uh, life thereafter? Any final thoughts, sir? Well, I'm glad I did it. I have no regrets, and I'd do it all again. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, about amen. It. Well, then on that note, um, that'll bring us uh, to the end of our podcast. And again, we thank uh, Jocko Willink and his team for making these SOGCasts possible. And we also thank all of our military service members for today. They are keeping our country safe. And we also thank the first responders, Border Patrol, different law enforcement agencies, um, even the FBI, which sometimes has, has some negative headlines lately. And uh, we also want to make sure that we thank the men and women who served our country for years past and like Joe Parner here today, are what we would call heroes who defended the values of America. And Joe, we thank you for that. And last but not least, we also remember and salute the men and women who have served our country and who have not come home. And as of today, 2021, there are 1,584 Americans that are still listed as missing in action uh, from the Vietnam War in Southeast Asia, which would include Laos, Cambodia. And our Special Operations Association had a memorial breakfast where we mentioned the name and saluted and tribute, paid tribute to 132 Americans just from the Secret War alone. 50 plus Green Berets who remain missing in action today, as well as the additional airmen the aviators that died supporting SOG teams on the ground. And that is, includes uh, Marine Corps assets that supported us throughout the entire war in the top secret war, Army and Air Force. And occasionally, like your case, you had Navy dropping bombs in support of you all. And it was a war hidden from the American public but now people like yourself are writing books and we're thankful for that. God bless America. Until next time. Thank you, Tilt. Airborne.